how it started versus how it's going. In today's video, I'm going to show you how I became an international racing driver. This is my story from my 20 years in motorsport. My name is David Pittard. I'm a Nürburgring champion, international racing driver and driver coach with over 20 years experience in the motorsport industry as well as all-round petrol head. In this video, I'm going to talk to you about that 20 years worth of experience that I have from starting in a go-kart at 8 years old to now racing around the world at 28 years old. This is going to be the first in a succession of videos that document my experience, so please make sure you subscribe to not miss a thing. In this video, I'm going to go through all my on-track and off-track results and everything that made it happen because it's not just being fast on circuit that determines whether you can make it to the top of motorsport or not. Plus, at the end of the video, I'm going to give you my three top tips that I would advise myself if I could start all over again. So, starting at the beginning, I can put a lot of this down to my dad. A massive petrol head, a Formula 1 fan, a MotoGP fan, an engineer, and I've inherited a lot of his characteristics from that. Uh, Dad always used to take me to the likes of Brands Hatch and Silverstone to watch club and international motorsport, uh, and that really started my journey as a petrol head in itself. I did well at school, just before my eighth birthday, my parents asked me what I wanted to do. The natural response was going to be, I want to go go-karting. Uh, you had to be eight years old at the time, so I actually had to lie about my age to get on track for the first time, and this photo is actually taken from the first time I ever got out of a go-kart. And you can see from that euphoric uh, grin that that was an addiction that has paved the way for my life so far. From that photo, I then joined the local kart club. Uh, after about 18 months, a group of us from that indoor kart club all then joined a team in proper MSA, Motorsport UK, licensed racing in the UK. So I started my karting journey at 2002 when I first gained my official competition license. From 2002 to 2006, I competed at a club level at my local circuits of Kimbolton, Shennington and Wilton Mill. In those four years, I racked up a couple of club championships before then graduating to national championships in 2007 and 2008. That championship was the Stars of Tomorrow series where I finished 11th in the UK and 13th in the UK and also had a notable performance at the Kartmasters Grand Prix in 2008 where I started right at the back and made my way through to the podium to gain driver of the day and my first test in a Ginetta Junior race car as a reward for getting on the podium. Pittard on the Biesi chassis. Well, a chassis that's massively popular. He's third and look at that, he is right in the mix. What a stonking drive from David Pittard. Third place, David Pittard. Third. Oh, I'm really, I'm so happy. It's really good. For 2009, we went back to club racing when it got to a point where we're thinking, what else is there to achieve from karting? Let's try and go to cars. With the resources available to me, it was actually cheaper to go production car racing than it was to carry on karting. The choice of championship was the Toyota Mark 1 MR2 racing series. Semi-slick tyres, mid-engine, rear-wheel drive, it was the next logical step and logical challenge. There were no career aspirations in driving a GT car straight away. It was just what we saw as the best opportunity to learn good car control and improve my driving going forward. It was a very up and down year as I made lots of mistakes in my first year. However, as it was a very cheap and entry level series, they didn't cost me a huge amount. The year culminated by winning my final race of the year, which was a big achievement to get my first car racing win. For 2011, I entered the Sports 2000 series. Again, this was a very entry-level sports car championship, but this time in a purpose-built race car on slick tyres. This gave me more learning of what a proper race car is built for and how it handles, and also learning slick tyres, which was a big step up from the cut slicks that I was driving beforehand. I actually won a test in a Formula Renault by competing in the Henry Surtees charity karting event and finishing third. There I learned a lot again about driving a proper race car on proper slicks with some aero then as well. And then throughout that winter I also tested a Porsche 997 Carrera Cup car which culminated from the production car stuff I'd done in 2010, the sports car racing stuff I'd done in 2011 and the single seater testing as well. Which This was when things started to become a little bit more serious where I really started to consider this as a career. 2012 started with a failure. I entered the Mazda MX-5 championship but finished runner-up meaning that I had to rearrange my plans at last minute. At this point, I waited for the right deal beyond the beginning of the season to enter the Brick Car British Endurance Racing Championship. That year, I'd be driving a Porsche 996 Carrera Cup car, and this was the perfect grounding for my GT career going forward. A big, powerful GT car 
with slicks, small amount of aero, in an endurance race format sharing with multiple drivers. The year was good, we scored multiple fastest laps and pole positions, however some reliability issues cost us some results, but at the end of the day we still won the class championship. The year also ended with a failure as I entered the Tesco backed KX Energy Scholarship Competition for additional funding for the 2013 season on the British Touring Car Package. However, I wasn't chosen as one of the top five drivers, therefore I had to, again, go back to the drawing board and look at my options for 2013. In 2013, I entered the Ginetta GT5 Challenge Championship. The Ginetta Championships appealed as there was a clear ladder of progression from club motorsport to national and international motorsport, all within the same manufacturer family. The year went well with three wins, five podiums and a lot of experience gained again on slick tyres in a sports car with a sequential gearbox. The year didn't end very well as I ran out of budget meaning that I missed the final round and only finished fifth in the championship. However, during the year I was scouted as a British Racing Driver Club rising star. I also won the Henry Surtees charity karting competition. The prize for that was to test a GP3 car or F3 car at Abu Dhabi at the Yas Marina circuit with top single-seater team Carlin Racing. That was a massive experience, especially for me at the time. I learned a huge amount driving the single-seater with proper aero, proper slicks, on a proper track with a proper team as well. And that, again, helped me build my engineering knowledge and general car knowledge going forward in my career as well. Over the winter of 2013 and 2014, I reapplied for the Tesco-backed KX Academy Scholarship. Having gained more experience in the GT5 Challenge Championship and showed race winning potential, as well as my Henry Surtees karting win, as well as testing a GP3 car in Abu Dhabi, as well as the off-track activities, including raising money for Tesco's chosen charity in a half marathon, I was chosen for the scholarship competition to enter the Ginetta GT4 Super Cup on the British Touring Car Package in 2014. The Ginetta GT4 Super Cup was my first time driving in a super competitive championship with a proper GT4 race car and with a proper race team backing me. The season had ups and downs both on and off track. The beginning half of the year I firmly confirmed myself as a championship challenger by learning the series very quickly and at Thruxton the third race meeting of the year dominating the weekend to firmly put myself in championship contention. The lows of the season came in the middle of the year where I was off track struggling to find the budget where sponsors that had committed at the beginning of the year were starting to drop out. Also I had some reliability issues and, and suffered a bit from lack of testing because of that budget de deficit. However I managed to turn it around at the end of the year and end the year on a massive high and finish with 5 wins, 14 podiums and 8 faster slaps and 2nd in the championship. It was an amazing year on track, as I've really confirmed myself, I, I believe, as one of the top GT drivers of the future. And off track, I also got to work with British touring car legend Jason Plato as part of the KX Academy, who taught me a huge amount about the business side of motorsport and the commercial side of motorsport. Having just finished my most successful year in 2014, I was only focused on turning pro in 2015. I looked at a number of opportunities in the UK, however my relative lack of experience meant that no one was willing to trust me as a pro driver in their car sharing with an AM driver in any GT endurance racing. As a result I had to look at other means to stay relevant and stay in the motorsport industry. One of the best opportunities from that year was getting in contact with Ginetta USA. One of their drivers was able to pay for me to fly out to Miami and pay me to race that weekend in the Miami Sunset 300 where I set the fastest lap in class and also finished on the podium with that gentleman driver. I also further expanded my coaching abilities where I looked after Ginetta Junior driver Ben Green for the year. That allowed me to stay in the British Touring Car Paddock and network regularly with all of the teams that I wanted to drive for in the future. I also was confirmed as the want to race judge for a scholarship competition, further confirming my ability to coach and nurture young talent and people wanting to drive faster in cars. 2016 was a very similar story to 2015. I wasn't able to raise any budget and I wasn't able to find any professional drives. 
There was one opportunity where I competed in the Silverstone 24 hours where I was able to help out Team Brit, both on a coaching point of view, so I coached their drivers to be able to enter and be competitive in the Silverstone 24 hour, and I also helped out the team commercially, who are very good when it comes to that anyways, but I was able to get some budget across the line, which helped me in cover my cost for my seat for the race. That was all for racing wise, unfortunately, that year. And whilst I was working full time at the end of 2016, I made the decision to come back to a normal job, a normal career at any time in my life. And at the end of 2016, I went full in and fully focused on becoming a professional GT driver. And from 2017 onwards, that's where the vlogs, that's where the channel really began and really began to take off. So I'm not gonna cover that in too much detail, but if you wanna see my story from 2017 to today, then make sure you check out my previous videos to follow the story from the beginning there all the way to where we are now. So in this video, I've pretty much touched on all of the on-track activities and achievements that I've completed. But looking back on all my notes, this barely scratches the surface of everything that I've done off-track to make the on-track stuff happen. So let me know in the comments what you want to know I did off-track that complemented my on-track uh, activity, performance, and ultimately got to where I am. Whether that's sponsorship, I think we're definitely going to cover that, uh, networking, and generally learning the motorsport business side of things. That's how I made it to being an international racing driver. However, if I were to give myself three pieces of advice, if I went all the way back to 2000 and told myself how to make it to this position right now, these are my three tips. Tip number one, probably the most important one, is see motorsport as a business, not just as a sport. It would be great to think that the best driver and the fastest driver are always rewarded by getting to the top. That is not the case whatsoever. Yes, you have to be fast, that's an absolute given, but that can't be the only thing you can offer. Look at motorsport as a business and look how you can add value to people that's gonna help them achieve their aims, which in turn is gonna help you achieve your aims. Step number two, don't bother starting unless you're completely obsessed and dedicated. There's a saying in motorsport that says that 99% of motorsport is a low and 1% of motorsport is a high. And that 1% of motorsport being a high makes up for the rest of it. That is completely true. There's gonna be so much rejection and failure and general lows that you're gonna to have to get through just for that addiction of being on a high, having gone through all the hardship to complete your goals, whether that's to just get on the grid, whether that's to complete a certain particular bucket list race that you've got, whether that's to win a championship. Uh, yeah, you've really got to be dedicated because there's so many other people fighting for that, that you have to stand out away from other people as much as you can. Step three, never, never, never give up. In my position when I first started, I always felt like I was up against it. There were people spending more money than me, being able to test more than me, having new tires more than me, uh, but I just had to deal with what I had and try and do the best that I can. You can't go into a race weekend with a negative mindset thinking that you've already been beaten because other people have prepared more than you. You have to prepare as much as those guys in other ways so that you don't let them have an advantage at all. In my experience, the closer you get to the top of the sport, the more level the playing field becomes. The more tyres you end up having, the more testing you end up having, and if you can perform whilst having one hand tied behind your back by not testing and, and not having tyres, once you get that opportunity, you're only going to flourish even more. Thank you very much for watching this video. Uh, I know I've only scratched the surface of both my career on and off track. I mean, I could have made a video that's probably an hour long about everything I did to make it to this point right here. Let me know any key, if you want to see a longer video like this where I can go into these key points in more details and maybe make it more of a, uh, a podcast type interview as opposed to this uh, face to camera format that we're doing right now. Anyways, please stay on the channel for more cool content. Please check out this classic onboard video down here and then check out where the vlogs started in 2017 to piece together the journey from starting my motorsport career to where I am now and there's going to be plenty more insight into motorsport going forward so make sure you stay subscribed up here so you don't miss a thing. Until next time, bis dann.